अच्छा ना दिस वन इज अ क्वेश्चन ऑन ऑन कॉम्प्लेक्स साइंस ठीक है सो व्हाट वर कॉम्प्लेक्स साइंस दे सेइंग दैट कोबाल्ट H2O6 2 plus is is a complex sign so this over here is your complex sign and uh, define the term complex sign so it's it's when a metal ion when a central metal cation it attracts lone pairs from ligands so dedibly it dedibly bonds to ligands and ends up forming a complex ion that's that's what a what a complex ion is so cobalt uh, they've drawn cobalt h2o6 uh, cobalt h2o6 is an octahedral complex so let me just revise that very quickly that in cobalt this cobalt 2 plus in solution uh, there are water molecules water molecules have lone pairs and uh, since they have lone pairs uh, what's going to happen is that cobalt is going to have uh, six sides and so there's the there's these x y and z axis so these are the these are the six axes and there would be water molecules that would be uh, bringing in the lone pairs the lone pairs would be attracted to cobalt theek hai all of them would be on the axis or remember ke when you were doing uh, when you did transition metals uh, which we going to do the anyways theek hai when in the other classes now in transition metals if you have a small ligand this is called a ligand a ligand is a species that has lone pairs and can form dative bonds with a metal ion theek hai so there's a metal ion swimming around in water these ligands they can be uh, exchanged so that is known as ligand exchange uh, if there's another ligand with lone pairs for example cl minus 1 or you add uh oh minus 1 or any other ligand uh they can sort of go and knock out these ligands and take their positions depending on the size if they are big ligands fewer ligands would be attached and they would form tetrahedral complexes or uh, in tetrahedral complexes you only have four ligands attached bigger ligands like cl minus 1 usually form tetrahedral ligands smaller ligands like oh minus 1 <coughs> Okay, so you have a uh, bigger ligands like Cl minus one. They would uh, not a lot of them would get attached. Like if you have a smaller ligand uh, like uh, OH, okay, smaller ligand. का पता किसना लगता है? You figure this out by by checking out its size. OH is seventeen. Water is eighteen. NH three is also a small ligand. Its uh, NH three is seventeen as well. Cl minus one is a bigger ion. It's it it has an ER of thirty uh, five. so that's a lot bigger ligand i said anyways that's that's the first thing and then uh they're talking about ligand exchange now in ligand exchange what happens is that they're saying that cobalt h2o6 2 plus the same ligand that i've drawn over here is reacted with sodium hydroxide and with excess of aqueous ammonia give the following information about these reactions and um they think they give the equation and the type of reaction that's actually taking place so in both cases with sodium hydroxide so i'm going to start with sodium hydroxide first what happens with sodium hydroxide is that if you bring in the oh ions the oh ions are going to come in and they would start knocking out the water molecules so here's uh, one water molecule that's going to get knocked out and oh minus 1 is going to take its place right and there might there would be another water molecule that would get knocked out if you add noh and another oh ion would take its place so what basically happens is that cobalt uh with uh now cobalt with the uh, with water molecules six of them this is going to be the reaction it's 2 plus two oh ions are going to come in and ligand exchange would happen and two of the ligands of water molecule ligands they're going to get replaced 
So two water molecules, they get knocked out. That is the equation that you're going to write. That's the first thing. And uh, the other thing they're asking is what type of reaction is happening. Although this is uh, ionic precipitation, but this eventually, uh, uh, it is a type of ligand exchange. But what happens in this reaction is that a precipitate of copper hydroxide is formed in the reaction. So CuH2O6, two plus, uh, which is pink in color. And it would end up forming a precipitate. And then you have uh, the reaction with excess ammonia. With excess ammonia, what happens is the same, pretty much the same thing happens uh, if you add ammonia. What would eventually happen is that let's say there is NH3 ligands that are getting added. What would eventually happen is that NH3 is going to come in and it would start knocking out these water molecules or these OH ions and it would start taking over. So NH3, N has lone pairs. N has lone pairs. And these lone pairs are going to come in. And they're going to take over. Uh, all six of the ligands can be displaced by NH3 or four could be displaced or any number of NH3s could displace the water molecule. So your equation would be in that case would be that you have cobalt, H2O6, 2 plus, and let's say four NH3 ligands, they come in. All six of water molecules can be displaced as well. So there would be two H2Os left and there would be four NH3s left. TK plus two water molecules are going to get knocked out. This is brown in color and this is pink in color. So you have to know the colors of the of the ions as well. And this is known, this one is ligand exchange. The previous one was precipitation because this was a, this over here was a precipitate that is formed of copper hydroxide CO, COOH2. TK, is this clear everyone? Reba, is this clear? Yes, sir. Sarah, is this clear? Yes, sir. But what's the color of the precipitate after it's formed? Is it just... TK, just let me also confirm whether they're using precipitation <coughs> or not. Okay, let's open the, is this a PDF? Just one second. So it's this one. This was the first question, right? Take is the first question. So the first one is referred to as precipitation and the second one is <clears throat> ligand exchange. And uh, TK, the color, uh, which color were you asking? The precipitate. This one, you're talking about this one, right? Yes. This is, this is the blue precipitate, TK. This over here has to be Brown, uh, which color were they asking actually? The color and state of the cobalt containing species. So which, whose color is, are they asking? I mean, this is definitely not blue. This is actually pink. And the one with ammonia is brown. Just one second, let me check. Cobalt with NH3 is, why are they writing blue? M4 is blue. Uh, let me just quickly cobalt with NH3 is definitely. Uh, I mean, these are the colors given. It's definitely brown. So this over here. Why did they write? Why are they writing blue in both cases? That needs to be checked. 
because with NH3, it's it's going to turn brown. That's that's the color. But let me I'll uh, and they're saying blue solution. This this is probably this is probably a typing error. Okay, it can't be a blue solution because both of them are not blue. I mean, I mean that's for sure. I mean, this is pink and this is brown and this is all this is also not not blue. Is this cobalt or are we talking about copper? Because in the case of copper, this is correct, but not for cobalt. So is this clear? I mean, the colors over here that are given in the market seem they're definitely wrong. Okay, they are hundred percent wrong. So is this clear? Okay. Yes, sir. Where did the market scheme go? This is the market scheme, right? Uh, cobalt is uh, is never blue. It's only blue with Cl minus one. So remember these colors. That cobalt with NH three, uh, that is brown, and cobalt with OH, it uh, is kind of green, and cobalt with water, that's pink. Okay, this is what pink. This is the pink that I've written over here. So so they. I think the market scheme because for summer twenty there was no exam. So I think the marking scheme is just kind of, it's probably not the correct marking scheme. Uh, moving to the next one. And, and remember these colors for cobalt, both of these reactions. These reactions are very important and they also, uh, they are also asked for copper as well. Now for copper uh, with water, that's blue. Copper with OS, that's a blue precipitate. Copper with water, that's blue again. Copper with NS3 is deep blue or a deep blue solution is formed. So you have to know the colors of the complexes of cobalt, and you have to memorize the colors of the complexes of copper as well. I'll send you notes for transition metals uh, where all these colors are mentioned. The marking scheme for this one is probably incorrect. Uh, next one is that you have, uh, so the next one is when concentrated hydrochloric acid is added to a solution containing cobalt water sex, a blue solution of, I mean, now they're right. A blue solution of COCl4 is formed. And the following equilibrium established. Use the Shatler principle to suggest the expected observation when silver nitrate is added, solution is added, dropwise to the blue solution. So what's going to happen if you add silver nitrate? Now, silver nitrate, this is this is the equilibrium that is established over here. If you add silver nitrate, silver nitrate has silver ions. And if you know silver ions, they combine with Cl ions to form AgCl, AgCl solid. So they form AgCl solid. So all the Cl ions would eventually be removed from the solution. So in this reaction, the quantity of Cl ions would be would decrease. If it decreases, then the equilibrium should shift in the in the backward direction. Uh, so silver ions would uh, consume all the Cl ions. There would be lesser Cl ions. So the forward reaction would not happen, and the backward reaction would be favored. And if it is favored, then what's going to happen is uh, the expected observation. This thing, solution would turn pink. It turns pink because CuH2O6, two plus is actually formed. Uh, so that's the ex expected observation. So blue solution would turn into a pink solution. Is that clear? But there is CL negative in the backwards also. Yeah, I mean that's that's what hap that's what's happening. I mean because CL lines are getting consumed. If the concentration of CL lines is lesser, I mean if there are fewer CL lines, what what does the Lee Shatler principle suggest? It suggests that uh, the equilibrium would try to make more CL lines. So more backward reaction would happen. And, okay. and if backward reaction happens, then this is produced as well as Cl minus one are produced. The extra Cl ions that are going to be produced, they're going to get consumed by the silver ions and it would form AgCl. Uh, so, so they're not in play. Uh, copper H2O6 would be formed, which would be, which they have already told you is uh, pink in color. I mean, I missed, I, it was actually blue in color. Pink was with water. Please, why it is it is pink in color? I mean, copper with H two O that is pink in color. Okay, the pink color is right. Now, next one. He's talking about stereoisomerism in in complexes. You have stereoisomerism. Uh, you have cobalt NH three 
thrice and CL thrice. And they're saying suggest the type of stereoisomerism. So I'm going to refer to this uh, diagram that I've drawn earlier. I'm going to ignore all the other ligands. You can rub them off. And I'm going to draw. Now he's saying. I said, now he's saying that. Uh, and let me draw a more uh, three dimensional diagram for this. Tiga, let me rub these off. I'll draw dotted line lines just to show all the axes in three dimensions. So that's going into the board. I said, now what's going to happen is uh, this thing that cobalt is surrounded by three NH3s and three Cl minus ones. So they are three Cl minus ones. That is one of the arrangements. Uh, and if you look at the arrangement, this is the, let's say this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and this is the z-axis. Then you can see that all the NH3s, they are 90 degrees to each other, and all the CLs are 90 degrees to each other. Uh, like this is on the y-axis, this is on the x-axis, this is on the z-axis. There's going to be another arrangement. What is stereoisomerism? Stereoisomerism is when the orientation of the bonds is different. So there could be another one where what I can do is I can switch the CL lines. Get, right now, none of the CL lines are 180 degrees to each other. They're all making an angle of 90 degrees. If you can see the axis, they're all 90 degrees to each other. Another arrangement would be, I take the CL minus one over here, and in its place, there is NS3 now. Get, that's, that's another arrangement. Now you can look, this is the second stereoisomer of the same molecule. Now you can see that the NH3s are exactly opposite to each other and they're making an angle of 180 degrees and the Cl minus ones are also making an angle of 180 degrees. So they're basically two different uh, stereo arrangements of the molecule. Two completely different stereo arrangements of the molecule. Either the Cl lines are all making an angle of 90 degrees to each other or the Cl lines are making an angle of 180 degrees to each other. And the NH3s are also making an angle of 180 degrees to each other. Is this clear? Ariba, is this clear? Sara, Aisha? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is, in an octahedral complex, you have stereoisomers. And you can just figure this out on your own. Think of it, how, how they can be different. Okay. Aisha, Ariba, is this clear? Yes, sir. So here you have to draw... So, okay, here you have to draw the two arrangements. And the type of stereoisomerism is known as cis and trans. Okay, now, cis and trans uh, are... Uh, the cis arrangement is when they're on the same side. Right now, the CL lines are on opposite sides. That's a trans arrangement. Uh, cis arrangement is when they're on the same side. Or instead, I mean... Uh, writing cis trans would actually not be the correct word. It should actually be geometric. Cis trans is the name that is given to a particular. So they're known as geometric isomers. Now, next one. They're saying that compound X, this is a tetradentate ligand. Suggests why one molecule of X can form four dative bonds. Uh, a tetradentate ligand is, uh, I'm going to draw the tetradentate ligand on the same molecule. That, could, that is capable of forming four data bonds. So it's going to be a very large molecule. And the molecule would be so large that one of the atoms of the molecule would be datively bonded over here. The other one would be datively bonded over here. So this, there's this one big molecule and it has all these different atoms that are capable of forming four data bonds from four different directions. So this, so this hypothetical molecule is a tetradentate ligand, that it's so big and it's so connected that different atoms of the same molecule are forming data bonds from different sides. Uh, so that's what a tetradentate ligand does. So they're saying this is a tetradentate ligand. A ligand has lone pairs. So this N could form a data bond from somewhere. This N could also form a data bond from somewhere. This N could also form a data bond and this N 
could also form a dative bond. So, so suggest why one molecule of X can form four dative bonds. It's a one mark question because it has four lone pairs of nitrogen. And like the diagram that I've shown, N over here is forming a data bond, another N from somewhere else, somewhere else. So four different data bonds are formed. Uh, you be clear, is this clear? Mehfuz clear? Aisha, is this clear? Yes. Aisha, so next one is, they think C6H18 N4 reacts with aqueous cobalt-2 ions in a 1-1 one -one ratio to form a new complex ion. Uh, it's, they're basically talking about this, this thing over here. Uh, I mean, it's basically this thing. Construct an equation for this reaction. Now, it's very simple. Like, and we've just done this. Let me redraw this quickly. I mean, ignore the tetradentate for a second. They're saying cobalt is surrounded by, ignore these X and Ys, etc. I said, so cobalt is surrounded by water. Water with its lone pairs forming data bonds on all sides. And Imagine a tetradentate ligand coming in. So how many water molecules are going to get knocked out? Four of them. Because tetradentate means it's going to replace four of the ligands that were previously attached with their lone pairs. So four water molecules are going to get knocked out by this huge tetradentate ligand that they're saying, TK, whose sketch I'm drawing. So that's your equation. You just have to describe this in equation form. I mean, the tetradentate ligand they are talking about is this one. It's C6H18N4. It's this one. So this molecule over here is C6H18N4. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, write the equation now of what's happening. Okay, so you just had, you had six water molecules initially, a tetradentate ligand came in, okay, like the one shown, knocked out four of the water molecules, took its position, took their positions. And instead, the atoms of that tetradentate ligand are now attached to the cobalt ion. So the answer would be, you have to make an equation, COH2O6, and it is two plus, uh, one tetra, only one tetradentate ligand is possible. So that's C6, H18, and then four. So cobalt would now only be surrounded by two water molecules as shown in the diagram over here. So once the four more water molecules are knocked out, cobalt is now surrounded by two water molecules. And one of them is this tetradentate ligand. So I'm going to write... Uh, What's the formula of the tetradentate ligand? It's C6H18N4. And it's going to be two plus tel. Plus there would be four water molecules that would be knocked out by this tetradentate ligand. Uh, and let me check whether we have made the right, otherwise the equation. This one, TK. So we made the right equation. There are only two water molecules remaining and one tetradentate ligand and four water molecules get knocked out. So that is what is happening. This is the equation that we made. So this one is correct, TK. Are you guys this clear? Yes, sir. TK, good question to me. Uh, Aisha, Sarah, clear? Yes, sir. I said, yes. now this one. I said, so describe and explain the trend in the solubility of group two hydroxides down the group. You get this very typical question very often in almost all past papers. Uh, first thing, group two hydroxides. Uh, down the group, solubility increases. MgOH2 is right at the top of the group. It's insoluble. And as you go down the group, uh, at the bottom, there's barium hydroxide, which is very, very soluble. Uh, 
So that is soluble and it should be aqueous. Uh, in the middle, calcium hydroxide is partially soluble and the bottom two are strontium hydroxide and barium hydroxide are soluble. So how do you describe the trend in the solubility? The first point would be, the first mark would be solubility increases down the group. That's, that's the first mark. But then the question is, why does it increase? So let's talk about solubility. What is solubility? Like if I have to draw, if I have to dissolve uh, magnesium hydroxide, for instance, what is the Hess cycle for dissolving magnesium hydroxide? What are the steps that need to be taken? So there's magnesium hydroxide solid. You mix it in water and it becomes magnesium hydroxide aqueous, which means that Mg2 plus aqueous and two OH ions are aqueous, right? This is what's happening. You have taken a beaker and you have Mg and OH ion. Initially, they're forming a crystal, a solid. So you have all these Mg ions and OH ions and they're all uh, tightly attracted to each other. So they are an ionic, they are an ionic lattice uh, with very strong bonds. So in between, there would be very strong force of attraction between positive and negative ions. So there's this crystal lattice that exists, an ionic lattice, right? And there's water over here, lots of water molecules, and you're trying to dissolve this. Uh, the first step would be, I said, what is this called? This is called the enthalpy change of solution. I said, why is it, why is it the enthalpy change of solution? Because by definition, one mole of, an, of, a, of any substance, if you mix it in water, it becomes aqueous ions uh, and dissolves. So the energy that would be released or absorbed uh, in the reaction, whether it's exothermic or endothermic, that energy would be called enthalpy change of solution. I said, now that's enthalpy change of solution. But what are the steps involved? The very first step is that you have to somehow break the lattice. I mean, you start stirring vigorously. Why do you stir? The lattice, the strong forces of attraction, uh, the lattice breaks. Okay, Mg2 plus and the OH ions, they get scattered in water. And they dissociate in water. Right? Is this clear, Sarah? Is this clear? Yes. So the first step, the very first step is you break the lattice. And when you break the lattice, that is called the negative of lattice energy. That's an endothermic process. TK, it's an endothermic process. But you would have to stir vigorously so that you can break the lattice. And once you break the lattice, it's going to form, uh, the ions would dissociate. Right? So the OH ions and the Mg ions, they would be separate from each other. And right now they haven't bonded to anything. So I'm writing them as gaseous ions. Get, nothing is next to them. I've just, I've just stirred the spoon vigorously so that the ions get scattered. What's the next part? The next part is they would start interacting with water molecules and they would start forming bonds with water molecules. Get, that's the next step. As soon as the lattice breaks, they start forming bonds or they start attracting water molecules exactly like the way, uh, exactly like the way this, this cobalt ion was doing. It was attracting water molecules and it's lone pairs. So cobalt would start attracting. So Mg ions would do the exact same thing. So they would get surrounded by water molecules, lots and lots of water molecules. That's known as the enthalpy change of hydration. So your gaseous ions, they would become aqueous ions. And that's known as delta H hydration. And this is exothermic because bonds are being formed in this case. Ariba, clear the cycle, clear it. Uh, Aisha, is this clear? Yes, sir. Ali, clear it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so these are the two steps. And that's your enthalpy of solution, H cycle. You can be asked to draw this cycle as well. Uh, probably not in this question, but in some other question, you might be asked to draw this. 
Now you have this enthalpy change of solution. Now, enthalpy of solution is if it re releases energy, like if it's exothermic, then it's more likely to be soluble. Like if the whole process, this overall process, I mean, it required these two steps, right? If the whole process is exothermic, the thing would be more soluble. So what's actually happening is one of the part is endothermic, the first part. The second part is exothermic. So what that basically means is that since solubility is increasing down the group, that means the exo part is actually increasing in size. More energy is being released and it, it is actually becoming easier to break the lattice and more energy is uh, released uh, when uh, bonds are formed with water molecules and they turn aqueous ions. So that's the whole process. Uh, why does the enthalpy change increase? Now, two things happen. Down the group. Do you give further discussion on this? Well, it's a four mark question. Now, down the group, what happens when you move down the group? Uh, you have bigger cations. And remember if, if, remember, if the ions are bigger in size, whenever the ions are bigger in size, so your lattice hota, that's weaker. Bigger ions, bigger atoms, they always make weaker bonds. So lattice energy decreases. So it's going to become, both of them would decrease. So lattice energy, is your endothermic wala part and that decreases. And since the down the group, uh, the cations are bigger, so water will be with strongly attract. Nahi karenge. So weaker bonds banenge, so enthalpy of hydration also decreases down the group. Bigger ions, they form weaker bonds. Uh, or bigger ions only, the lattice be weak, hoga, so it would be easier to break and weaker bonds would be formed. So both of these values are going to decrease. Pehle to tak lech lete. Answer ke andar. The answer would be solubility increases down the group. Why? As cationic radius increases, Okay, ions become bigger. Both lattice energy and delta H hydration, they decrease. Okay, it's, it's becoming easier to break the lattice, but at the same time, uh, the bonds that are formed with water molecules, they're also weaker. So both of them are decreasing. But since the solubility overall is increasing, if the solubility overall is increasing, that means the exothermic part would still be bigger compared to the endothermic part. Down the group, the solubility is increasing. Like if you have MgOH2, down the group, you have barium hydroxide. So the solubility keeps on increasing. It becomes more soluble. It becomes more exothermic. That means the exo part is not decreasing as much as the endothermic part. So that's your last part, which is that lattice energy decreases more compared to enthalpy of hydration, which was your exothermic part uh, where bonds were being formed. So that's making overall delta H solution exothermic. Okay, Aisha, clear? Yes, sir. Ariba clear? Uh, Sara, is this clear? Yes. I just remember this question would come very often. Remember the solubility of uh, hydroxides as well as sulfates. Uh, that this is the Hess cycle. You break the lattice and the ions are formed and the ions, they attract water molecules and they form hydration. I mean, this is hydration. This part is exothermic. This part is endothermic. Enthalpy of solution, the substance would be more soluble if it's exothermic. And it can only be exothermic if the exothermic part is bigger and the endothermic part is smaller in size. But when you move down the group, you have bigger ions. So that means uh, uh, if you move down the group, uh, this would be lesser as well, and this would be lesser as well. Down the group, both lattice energy and enthalpy of hydration would decrease. But since the solubility is increasing, and it's becoming more soluble down the group, uh, and it's becoming more exothermic, that means this would be bigger relatively compared to 
the endothermic part. Ali, is this clear? Yes, sir. And there's, there's another, usually another question related to this, and that's about the solubility of sulfates. Down the group, the sulfate solubility of sulfates actually decreases. So if it decreases, that means the endothermic part is actually becoming greater compared to the exothermic part. So since both are decreasing down the group, exothermic decreases more compared to the endothermic, or you can say the enthalpy of hydration decreases more compared to the lattice energy. Achha, ne next one is about decomposition. Uh, so this which of MgOH2 or SROH2 will decompose at a lower temperature. So it's going to be, uh, the answer would be MgOH2. Easier to decompose. It's easier to decompose. And the question is, why is it easier to decompose? Uh, the answer to that is that Mg2 plus is a smaller ion. Think of MgOH2 and strontium is a bigger ion. So you have these two ions. There's uh, this one is Mg, I mean, this one is Mg2 plus. And the other one is strontium 2 plus. Now, this has a much greater charge density. A smaller ion with plus two charge, this charge is a lot more effective, a lot more stronger. Uh, so what happens is that it has very high polarizing power. Like it, it has a much greater force of attraction. So if you have OH ions lying around, right, and the two OH ions. So it's going to attract the OH ions so strongly and so strongly that eventually the O would kind of break off and this O would get attracted to the, because there would be so, I mean, the attraction would be so strong that the O instead of sharing its electron with hydrogen is going to get attracted or pulled by two plus Mg. And the molecule would decompose. So the MgOH2 would turn into MgO. And a water molecule is going to be released. So let me draw what's going to happen. That this It's a lot. So, uh, so the point is about decomposition. Uh, let me explain the point again that if you have a smaller ion with greater charge density, it's going to attract the other negative ions so strongly that it's going to polarize it. It's going to pull the oxygen away from it. Uh, instead of attracting the whole negative ion, it's going to attract a few atoms of the negative ion so strongly that it's going to pull them and keep them with it. An NGO would be formed. The same pretty much happens with carbonates as well. Like if you have a smaller cation, the charge density is very, very large. And if you have a carbonate ion, then it, the attraction would be so strong that the oxygen would completely get pulled towards the, towards the, let's say this is Mg2+, plus, a very small cation, that they would form MgO and the carbon dioxide molecule would break off. TK, is this clear, Ali, Sara? Ariba, is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mg2 plus has smaller radius? Yeah, compared to strontium. Strontium is lower down in the group. I mean, strontium has a lot of okay. electrons. Uh, so the way that you're going to write is that it has a smaller ionic radius, has a higher charge density, that's one mark. And the OH ion gets polarized. Well, it's, it's the Mg2 plus would be so strongly attracting the OH ion that it's going to pull the oxygen away and uh, take all its electrons and keep it with it. Okay. So that's your two marks for that. Uh, then you have the next question is 
the overall reaction for photosynthesis is shown. Use these, use these equations to deduce the half equation for the reduction of carbon dioxide in the in this process. So this as this one is a kind of a complicated question. Uh, I'll first explain what happens when you have a redox reaction. Uh, when you have a redox reaction, how do you make an overall reaction? Like you have aluminum plus three and it gains three electrons and it forms aluminum metal, for example, this is happening. And there's a, uh, and simultaneously there is sodium and sodium loses electrons to form sodium ions and loses one electron, right? So there's, there's a reaction where reduction is happening and oxidation is happening. One atom gains electrons, the other loses electrons. How do you make overall reactions? Like what's overall that's happening in this reaction? Because this is a hypothetical reaction I'm talking about. That a reaction is happening where uh, sodium loses electrons, aluminum ions gain electrons. There's a reduction equation and there's an oxidation equation. The way you make overall equations is that you uh, add the, you make the number of electrons equal. So you multiply this by three and then you add them up. So it's going to be aluminum plus three and three sodium. So the left hand, left hand side are added and over here there's three Na plus one and there's one aluminum. So that's how you make your overall reaction. Reduction equation and oxidation equation are added up to give you this overall reaction. Now, in this question, this specific question, what is actually happening is, is this clear, this part? Reema, is this clear? Aisha, clear? Sara? Yes. Achha, so reduction equation, oxidation equations, add them up, you get the overall reaction. Now, what's happening in this example? In this example, what's happening is, one of the equations is missing. Okay, let me get rid of this. I said, now in this reaction, the overall reaction is already given. It's given as 6 CO2 plus 6 H2Os and they end up forming C6 H12 O6 plus 6 O2. Okay, so the overall reaction is given. And they've given you one of the half equations that, uh, and that's the oxidation equation. They're saying that this equation is formed when there's two water molecules and they lose electrons uh, to form O2 plus 4H plus 1 plus 4 electrons. So that's so that's your oxidation equation. And you're being asked to find the reduction equation. What's the reduction equation? Like, And you're already given the overall reaction. You know that the two equations, they end up, if you add them up, if you add them up, the two equations should give you, they should give you this equation. So, so use the equations to deduce the half equation for the redu reduction. Okay, so you have to figure out reduction. Okay, so it's a tricky question, reduction. Now, you know that these things, they got added up to get give you this thing, right? So what is missing over here on the right side? I mean, there's C6, H12, O6 missing. That's obviously true. Okay, so there's C6, H12 and O6 that is missing. I said before, before even doing that, uh, I think that we should first figure out how many electrons are being gained and how many electrons are being lost in the final equation. Uh, so I'm just going to have a look at the final equation. C is over here plus four. C on the other side is, I mean, let's look at oxen first. Oxen over here in both cases is minus two. And oxen over here is zero. So basically oxen is going from minus two to, it's going from minus two to zero. And how many oxygen molecules are being formed. There are 12 oxygen molecules that are being formed. How many electrons are actually being lost? Minus two. Oxygen is minus two over here. Oxygen is also minus two over here. On the other side, oxygen is a neutral molecule. 
so its oxidation state is zero. So minus two to zero, that means two electrons are lost, right? That means. Is clear, Sara Ali? Ariba, is this clear? Yes, sir. Achha, yes, that, so that means minus. Yes, two, okay, that means minus two electrons are lost. But in total, zero wale oxygens kitne form ho rahe? There are twelve oxygens that are being formed. So agar, if I multiply this by twelve, if I multiply this by twelve, that means a total of how many electrons? Twenty-four. Okay, that means twenty-four electrons. So one thing is, and this is the oxidation half equation. So remember, what beach me part tha ke where you had to balance the number of electrons. So when oxygen is formed, this should be twenty-four electrons, not four electrons. So first, you correct it. Only then would you get this overall equation. So, how, which what number should I multiply this with? I should multiply it by six. If I multiply it by six, this would become six H two O. No, this would become actually twelve H two O. This would become six O two. That's that's how you're getting six O two, right? Uh, if I multiply this by six, this would become twenty-four uh, H plus one, and this one would also become. 24 electrons. Is this is this point clear? Ali, is this clear? Aisha, Ariba, Sara. Yes, sir. ठीक है तो minus two electrons oxidize हो रहा था. It was losing two electrons, but there were six O two. So मैंने जो half equation उसके अंदर आसान काम ये था कि I should have just multiplied this by six. So that the, so that you get six O two form or in a product can that so this would become six. The easier part was to just multiply the whole equation by six, and that's how you're going to get six O twos. Now second equation. Now let's focus on the missing equation. What's the missing equation? Final equation can that what is present? C six H twelve O six. That must be in the product in this equation. Why is it? Okay, now when the two equations got added up, oxidation reduction. That's where you're getting C six H twelve O six. तो C6H12O6 आ गया राइट साइड पे 6O2 और ऑलरेडी रहे व्हाट डू यू डू विद दिस 24H+1 बिकॉज़ देयर इज नो 24H+1 तो इसका मतलब है दे मस्ट बी गेटिंग सबट्रैक्टेड एंड देयर इज नो 24 इलेक्ट्रॉन्स सो दैट मींस दे वुड आल्सो बी मतलब राइट साइड पे दे मस्ट बी दे प्रोबब्ली सबट्रैक्टेड ठीक है बिकॉज़ प्रोडक्ट्स व्हेन दे गेट एडेड अप they should give you this thing i mean this thing should be your final right hand result so you have 6o2 and you have isko main underline kar leta hu 6o2 and c6h2o6 these two things should not have been there to maine wo niche wali equation mein i have added minus 24h plus 1 and minus 24 electrons theek hai to get rid of that acha on this side uh This thing should get added to something so that it gives you this thing. First thing, six CO two molecules are missing. So add the six CO two molecules, right? Another thing, instead of twelve H two O's, there are six H two O. So that means, this side there must be six H two O's getting subtracted, right? So now, if I add my left hand side, I'm going to get this. And if I add my Right hand side, I'm going to get this thing. So my reduction equation is this one, and I'm going to write the reduction equation in a proper way. Okay, what's what's the proper way? Okay, the minus things should be taken to the other side. So the actual equation for reduction would be. It would be six CO two. Bring in the minus things over here on the left side so that they are plus. So it's going to be plus twenty four H plus one plus twenty uh, four electrons. And in the product, you're going to have C6H12O6. Plus, take the minus 6H2O to the other side, so that's going to be plus 6H2O. So that's your reduction equation. Is this clear, Ali, Sara, Ariba? Is this clear? Yes, sir. But why um, six oxygen in the oxidation? Nee, this one. Yes. Nee, see, 
this equation was one of the half equations that uh, actually ended up making this equation, right? Yes. I mean, this half equation, the oxidation half equation got added up with another equation, which was your reduction equation, right? And they ended up forming this final equation, which is given over here. Now, so you, you got this equation. Now, how can you get six O2s in your products if your equation had just, I mean, the equation that you were adding up, your oxidation equation had only one oxygen. There has to be, I mean, the product, there would be six O2s, right? Only then would it would it give you six O2s in the products. Sarah, do you get this? Yes, sir. Okay, how would you get six O2 in the in your final reaction if your original equation over here had only one O2? So you would have to multiply this oxidation equation by by six, which I did over here. I multiplied everything by six, so I got uh, twelve H two or six O2s. 24 H plus one and 24 electrons, right? So that in my final equation, I would get six O2s. Sarah, do you get this point? Yes, sir. And this equation over here would get added up with this unknown equation over here to give you this final equation. So I started figuring out what should I add to this equation on the right-hand side so that I get this on my right-hand side. So there was C6H12O6 that was missing. So I added C6H12O6 in this unknown equation. 24H uh, plus one was not there. So I had to get rid of the 24H plus one on the right side. So I added minus 24H plus one. 24 electrons were not on the right side in the final equation. So I added minus 24 electrons in my reduction equation. So I, is that point clear as well? Yes, sir. And then on the left side, uh, I had 12 H2Os and then there was this unknown thing that gets added to give you this thing in the final equation. C6, uh, 6 CO2 and 6 H2Os. So obviously there's C6, uh, 6 CO2s which I added coming from here. And instead of 12 H2Os, there was 6 H2Os. So how can I get 6 H2Os over here if I add minus 6 H2 over here? So that when I add them up, I'm going to get this. So is this clear? Yes, sir. Okay, are you clear? question clear, Sara? Yes, sir. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Uh, the only problem with this question was that it's never been asked this way. You're always given one, a reduction equation and an oxidation equation, and you add them up to give the get the final equation. They've given you the oxidation equation. They gave you the final equation the middle equation was actually missing. So you had to figure out what things were actually missing. Okay, oxidation equation, what would you get added to the oxidation equation to give you this final equation? So TK will continue with this in the next class then, TK. Okay then. Take care, Lafayette.